Thank you, Mary. We appreciate you playing and, uh, the piano today. This is Mary Cannon on the piano today, and uh, we appreciate that prelude. God bless. Uh, I'm going to ask we all stand as we sing our call to worship today. The day after Christmas, we sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain. some good news for you if you were on the naughty list this year you get a whole nother chance again we're starting over <laughs> the bad news is you got a whole year to go uh, I, I take it everyone had a wonderful Christmas uh, it is good news Jesus Christ is born amen um, a few announcements as we get going I'm gonna talk about it before we get to the first slide it was the turkey shoot we had a good time at the turkey shoot and we have a, a winner amongst us today I won't, point, I won't point out Johnny over here, but uh, he's a winner. Also, uh, Carl and Barb's grandson, Alex, uh, won also. Congratulations, Johnny. Uh, there will be, as far as announcements here, there will be no evening service tonight. So don't come back tonight unless you just want to hang out. And no Wednesday services for this week either. If you're interested in the children or student ministries, we're going to have a meeting on January the 2nd at 5 p.m. This is just an information meeting to talk about what we do here uh, with the children and the student ministry. So if you're interested in that, join us at 5 p.m. Sunday, January the 2nd. And then uh, at this time, we're collecting donations for the tornado relief effort through the Southern Baptist Convention. But you'll make your check payable to Pleasant Grove with tornado relief in the memo down there. And then also, it's the time of year where we do our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And just as a reminder, 100% of that goes to missions and the International Mission Board. None of it stays here at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. It all goes uh, to the mission field. So if you'd like to be a part of that, our goal this year is $12,000. We'll watch a video in just a minute uh, about the Lottie Moon offering. But also, uh, it's the time for the winter clothing drive. We haven't had much cold weather yet, just a little taste of it here and there. But it's coming, all right? It's coming. And so it's that time that we need winter clothes for our clothing ministry. Uh, winter clothes only, as I'm sure Susie has put that on there for us. So uh, no room for spring and summer clothes yet. So, But if you have extras and you want to give to that, please do. Tens of thousands of people rallied Sunday to protest last week's coup. The military rounded up the nation's democratically elected leaders. Open fire on large crowds in several cities. Hundreds were arrested. Despite the growing international condemnation. 
in the book of Acts and Acts chapter 12, there's a lot of geopolitical things that are happening that everyone would have been talking about, would have been dominating the headlines. And yet in the background behind all of that, without anyone realizing the kingdom of God was spreading like wildfire all over the known world at that time. We work in an area of Southeast Asia that's experiencing a lot of turmoil and upheaval right now, a lot of anger, a lot of fear. At the same time, we've seen opportunities to share the gospel. People are very hesitant to believe in a God that they can't see. People worship both the spirits and Buddha. But when the pandemic hit, then all of a sudden everyone was afraid and everyone's lives were being changed because of this virus that was unseen. Well, hey, you're scared of something that you can't see. Let me tell you about something that you can't see that will free you from that fear that will give you life. Just outside our city, there's a small village of about 50 people. We got connected to an elderly woman, our national partner had been sharing the gospel with her. She said, I believe I'm in. And she has since been just an incredible force that God's used in the last year and a half or two years. We're hearing stories of 30 homes in this village coming to faith and this entire village coming to faith and half of this village come to faith. God's moving in some pretty exciting ways, but there's still a long way to go. Not knowing what the future holds has been really challenging. Even though there's upheaval and chaos in our region and around the world, we are more confident than we've ever been that this is exactly where we need to be. This is exactly what God has called us to do. In the background, maybe not making the headlines, people's lives will be changed, disciples will be made, and the kingdom of God will spread like wildfire. The reason that you never saw that missionary is because they're in a sensitive area. They're in an area where if their identity were known, it could be threatening to their life. So uh, some of our missionaries are in places where their names will never be published, their faces will never be published, and yet God knows exactly where they are and the great need for the gospel to be spread in those places. So I want to encourage you to prayerfully consider how to give to this offering. Every penny of this Lottie Moon International Missions offering goes to International Missions. None of it stays in this church. So I want to encourage you to think about those around the globe who need to hear the gospel. We do another offering for North American Missions around Easter, uh, but this is for International Missions. So pray about how God would have you to be a part of that. If you're here for the very first time, we welcome you. You are our special guest today. On the back of the pew in front of you, there should be a card. If you would, fill it out. Drop it in one of these slots on the way out. We're so glad to have you worship with us today. It's a blessing to have you here in God's house. And, and congratulations, you made it through the fog. I know it was kind of thick out there, but you, you made it here, and I, I'm grateful for that on this uh, last Sunday of this year. Next year will be in another year, a new year, and we're all praying 2022 will be a little better than 20 or 21. So, <laughs> But that's in God's hands, and we can trust it to him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, we thank you so much for your love, for your amazing grace, for this privilege of being in your house today. God, I, I thank you that <clears throat> we've been able to celebrate this season and rejoice at the coming of Christ. God, I pray for anyone here today right now that's never experienced Christ in their own life, who's not had a personal relationship. I pray that today would be their day of salvation. God, we give this time to you. We pray that our singing would glorify you hearts would be open to hear from you today. It's in your powerful and precious name we pray these things. Amen. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, 
and this life is in his son. So hail, heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail, Son of Righteousness. O come, all ye faithful, come and believe. Could anything be more amazing, more surprising, more unbelievable than this? God himself would take on hum human flesh and blood and walk among us. He was foretold by prophets and they believed. He was entrusted to a young peasant couple who would become his earthly parents and they too believed. He was sought out by shepherds and worshipped by wise men, each of whom believed. Adored by heaven, longed for by a nation, and heralded by angels. At last he had come, and all creation cried, Glory.
my, the problem was it occurs twice in this musical. <laughs> and the time, I wasn't clear as to which one I wanted. So, uh, so we sang the one they had, <laughs> so, which is the right one now. Thank you all. Guys, appreciate you so much in the back. But um, we're going to be singing now. The praise team is going to lead us in a song. I, I shared with them a little bit earlier. This is joy to the world. We know it. We've heard it so many times, and I have as well. But I was thinking about George Frederick Handel, who wrote the music to this. Uh, he was born in the same time J.S. Bach, the same year, in fact, uh, in 1685. But when he wrote this, this song, Joy to the World, uh, imagery with music was a part of the text sometimes. They would put the two together. If they sang of the cross, sometimes you would, you would, they would actually, if you looked on the page, it would be in the shape of a cross. And, and, and I'm thinking of that with the way they thought. Joy to the world. Da, 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 da. It went straight down from the highest to the lowest note of the scale. Jesus came. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. From here to here. It actually shows us what he did in coming to this world in the music. It's a hidden message, but it's there and it's definite and it's absolutely true. Let's all stand as we sing. Joy to the world.
singing. Rain standing, please. Our children are dismissed. Children's Church at this time. And we're going to continue with singing Silent Night, Holy Night.
ahead and take out your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to look at some more of the Sermon on the Mount. We'll get back to Titus in a couple of weeks and finish it up. But this Sunday and next Sunday, I wanted to look at a couple of texts in the Sermon on the Mount that we've been going through on Wednesday night. <clears throat> I'll have to confess there are some things that are hard for me to resist. If you were to put a hot Krispy Kreme donut in front of me, I'm just going to tell you right now, I don't have the willpower to resist that. Sorry, Doc, but it's just a reality. I can't resist a hot Krispy Kreme donut. If you put it in front of me, I'm going to eat one or two. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I heard somebody say four, five, or six. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> nope, that is sugar comatose right there. I can't get past two, and I'm, whew, that's too much sugar. But anyway, um. If you put a good piece of cheesecake in front of me, that one's going to be really hard for me to resist as well. Now, if I'm in full-blown diet mode, I can resist the cheesecake more than I can the hot Krispy Kreme donut. Ah, if you give me an open trash can and a tightly wadded piece of paper, I may or may not be able to resist the urge to toss it in from a distance. Just saying. Whenever I order food somewhere like Shane's or Chick-fil-A, and if the person waiting on me, instead of saying, can I get a name for the order, if they say, can I get a name, so far I have resisted the urge to say, don't you already have a name? <laughs> I've resisted the urge. I, I'm going to say it one day, I feel sure. But so far I've resisted that urge. Another place that sometimes I find it hard to resist the urge to respond to something is on social media. I have to be honest, there are a lot of times where I just have to force myself, keep scrolling, keep scrolling. When it's obvious they're misinformed on something and it's all I can do just to keep scrolling right on past that. I don't want to start an argument on social media. Also, while I'm not the grammar police, I confess that I do see some really bad grammar at times on social media. I am far from perfect in that area, but I do know which two, two, or two to use. I also know which there, there, or there to use, and I also realized that and the conjunction has a D on the end of it. I see some of you have experienced the same thing, but nevertheless, I have continued to resist the urge to correct that as well. Now, seriously, I shouldn't be so uptight about grammar as if, breaking, as if it were breaking the law by using the wrong word. The truth is social media is informer, informal and grammar can be relaxed and even incorrect. Grammar rules are meant for formal documents, term papers, things of that sort. We can simply appreciate the heart of the law so that we accurately communicate our point. The law had taught the people an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The law that's referred to here is referred to as lex talionis. It simply meant that the punishment should match the crime. This law was given by God to the people to keep them from going above, doing more than what was done to them, from exacting revenge. However, Jesus wanted the people and us to know that if we are to have Christ-like character, we must go beyond the law in our personal behavior. We must become a living reflection of His character in our lives. So I want us to see what He had to say in this great sermon, in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 38. And if you're able, I'll ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Matthew 5, verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. As for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. May the Lord add richly to the reading of his word. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that your word indeed is not a truth, but is the truth. God, I thank you for this wonderful sermon, this Sermon on the Mount. So much richness, so much life practical application for us within this. Lord, I pray that our hearts and minds would be open to hear from you right now and apply this truth in our lives. It's in your powerful and precious name we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. 
Now, in this passage, we find four marks of personal character in Christ. The first mark of personal character in Christ is restraint. Now, we find in verse 39 that Jesus says, when someone slaps your right cheek, you are to turn to them the other cheek. Now, understand, in in a society where most people are right-handed, to be slapped on the right cheek would have been a backhand. That was not so much a physical... um, sort of blow in the sense that it was a demeaning response. It was to be to belittle someone. It was an insulting gesture. Jesus was saying, when someone in, when would insult you, you must have the strength of character to stand firm and not stoop to their level. Don't run from them. Turn the other cheek. Jesus was saying, take the insult like a man with grace and dignity. It takes far more strength to take an insult without retaliating than it does to retaliate. Anyone can retaliate, but it takes a person of great strength to stand and face the insult without fighting back. Nowhere did Jesus say to run away from the situation. He said simply to turn the other cheek. This is a personal insult. If someone were insulting the kingdom of God or the, the, the faith in one way or another, then we're given clear example by Christ in defending the faith. Paul exhorts Timothy to be able to defend the faith, but be careful to defend the faith with a loving attitude and a desire to see God honored. Now, just in case we think that Jesus is giving us a command that he somehow doesn't stand behind himself, stop and consider the last few hours, last few moments of his life as he's here on earth, as he's being ridiculed, as he is being slapped in the mouth for for saying something that they thought was not right to be said And as he's being spat upon, as he's dealing with all this indignation, beaten, all these things, stripped of any dignity, keep in mind this is the man who could have said, you're done. And they would have been done. The greatest restraint ever exhibited is what Christ did in allowing that punishment to be applied to him and then ultimately being crucified on a cross for the forgiveness of our our sins. And then going on to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's restraint exhibited for us. Now, I know it'd be easy to say, okay, right, I know. I know he was was fully human, but he was also fully God, so that's superhuman strength. I mean, that's just more than than we could even begin to muster. Let me just drop a name on you, Stephen. Remember Stephen, the first Christian martyr? Remember as he's being stoned to death, that very guy who, who... should have been incredibly angry at those who were throwing stones at him, was able to say for them, Father, forgive them. That is restraint. That is strength under control. It took a lot more strength to do that. He was not somehow superhuman. He was human just like you and I. His physical makeup was no different than yours and mine. We were, we are all created in the image of God and we have the same power uh, within our grasp that he had that he was able to muster that up and forgive that crowd. I'm afraid that many of us do not have that kind of strength because we're unwilling to surrender ourselves to God. We're unwilling to ask him for that power. We're unwilling to, to let him fill us with his presence. When we've been insulted, our human nature causes us to want to lash back at those who have ins- insulted us. However, if the love of Christ is within us, if he is Lord in our lives, then we have access to the strength to return kindness for evil. It's not something that happens overnight, but it can be developed as we grow in Christ. And it's my prayer that each of us would have a desire to know God in His fullness, to have Him be Lord of our lives and become a living reflection of who He is, to develop His character. We must spend time alone with Him in prayer and studying His Word. It must become our all-consuming desire. So the first mark of personal character in Christ is restraint. The second mark of personal character in Christ is humility. Now it's indeed an often overlooked strength of character when someone can be humble enough to admit that they're wrong. We really believe that most of us uh, res- who respect people can admit, or rather I should say we, be- we respect those who can admit that they're wrong when they've done something wrong, a sincere apology Uh, When someone gives a sincere apology, we're more likely to be willing to forgive. And that's the essence behind verse 40. Jesus says, if someone wants to take your shirt, give him your coat too. Now you have to understand the context of what Jesus is speaking of. 
it wasn't uncommon in their day and time for someone to be brought to court to pay a debt that was owed. Often for someone who didn't have the money, then what would happen is that they would pay with their clothing. They would give their shirt for it. And, and most of the time they would have two or three shirts. But then the cloak was or coat was an outer garment and most people only had one of those. They would use this garment to cover themselves at night. They would wear it during the day. This was Jesus was saying, be willing to repay the debt that you owe. Essentially, if you owe a debt, you should be more than willing to repay the debt, and you should do it with sincerity. You should even be willing to give your outer garment that protects you during the day and covers you during the night. If you've wronged someone, you should be willing to seek their forgiveness, and you should do so with a tru truly generous attitude. Now, I know um, this doesn't really happen uh, for me, but it probably happens for you. I'm kidding. It happens for all of us. You know, if I, if I got in an argument with my wife, that's never happened. We don't argue. We, we have discussions. <laughs> my wife, was, that is so not true. Um, we're both stubborn people. We're both a little hard-headed, and we have an occasional argument. And uh, if, I've, if I've said something that I shouldn't have said, if I go to her and say something like, oh, come on, get over it. You know, I didn't mean it. Is that really an apology? No. That doesn't sound like I even remotely thought what I said was wrong. However, on the other hand, if I go to her and say, honey, I am really sorry. I was a bonehead. I shouldn't have said that. That sounds a little more repentant. Sounds a little bit more like I really mean what I'm saying. We need to be careful about what we do and, and be sincere in asking forgiveness. When you've wronged someone and they can sense that you're genuinely sorry for what you've done, they're more likely to forgive you. But let me say, you're not responsible for their response. You're responsible for what you do. If you apologize from a sincere heart, you can't control how they respond to that. The bottom line of what Jesus is telling us here is that we're to own up to our mistakes and to recognize how we may be indebted to someone. If someone feels as though we've wronged them or that we may owe them something, it honors God for us to work hard to resolve the situation, to be generous and conscientious, to see to it that no one has a genuine grievance with us is pleasing and honoring to God. That doesn't mean that the other party will always respond properly, but it does mean we have a responsibility to honor God. So we must be humble toward others, and when we have done wrong to someone, have the humility to apologize and try to make things right. But if you do wrong to someone unknowingly and later find out, we need to have the courage and the strength of character to admit when we're wrong. So the first mark of personal character in Christ is restraint. The second mark of personal character in Christ is humility. The third mark of personal character in Christ is submission. Now this is, we're to submit to God and we're to submit to others. Jesus tells us in this passage that we should be willing to go above and beyond whatever is asked or expected of us. That's the message behind go the extra or second mile. Every citizen was expected to go one mile with a Roman soldier whenever they were asked to do so. If the Roman soldier asked them, then they were to do it. A Roman soldier could request someone to carry that pack one mile, and they had to do it. Now, the measurement of the mile uh, in the Roman culture was a little shorter than our mile, but it's still a pretty good walk. But Jesus said, don't just go a mile. Go the second mile. Be willing to go above and beyond what's required or what's expected of you. You should be willing to go beyond the call of duty. Submit to God and submit to others. Be willing to serve others. We live in a society where so many people just want to do whatever they can to get by. Whatever the minimum amount of work, whatever the minimum amount of effort it is, that's what they'll give. There are very few workers who look around for more to do when they finish what's expected of them. And many times, those who do more are ridiculed by those who do the minimum. Hey, bud, you're making us look bad. Don't do any more. That's not the way it should be for us as believers. We should be giving our all, going above and beyond the call of duty. You remember the story of the woman who poured out her valuable perfume on Jesus' feet and wiped it clean with her hair. There were some of the disciples who were upset by that. There was one who said it could have been sold and given to help the poor, the needy. Jesus said, no, what she did, what she did was wonderful. What she did was above and beyond. What she did was she gave her all to show love 
to her master. That's what you and I are to be doing, giving our all to show love for our master. We need to go the extra mile. Many times we can be a witness to the very person who aggravates us the most by being nice to them and doing more for them than they expect us to do. Simple acts of kindness without any expectation of kindness in return can be a tremendous witness for Christ. Doing things that are not required of us for someone who may have a need or perhaps is hurting can be an opportunity to show someone Christ's love in the flesh. Even simply going beyond what is expected of you at work or at school or at home can be a witness of the love of Christ. You may have a family member that's lost and you may be able to witness to them simply by showing them the kindness of God by going above and beyond even when they don't deserve it. We could all surprise those around us by ministering to them, by doing things that aren't expected. Uh, young people, here's, here's, here's an idea. When you go home, clean your room, vacuum, make up your bed, put all your clothes away, all your toys away, and surprise your parents. Don't, don't have to be asked to do that, but be sure you have a defibrillator nearby so that if something happens to their heart rate, you can fix that. <laughs> Adult, you can go above and beyond the call of duty by helping a friend or a family member who may have a need. You can do more at work than your boss expects of you. You can be kind to a neighbor. Seek to honor God in all that you do. Go above and beyond the call of duty. Again, the Word of God tells us very clearly, do unto others as we would have them do unto us, not before they do unto us. So the first mark of personal character in Christ is restraint. The second is humility. The third is submission. The fourth is generosity. In verse 42, Jesus, Jesus makes it clear that we are to give to those who ask of us and not turn away from someone who wants to borrow from us. Now, this does not mean that we're to give to anyone and everyone that asks of us. It is not our responsibility to enable someone to do things that they shouldn't be doing. It's not our responsibility to make someone immature because we've done so much for them they don't know how to make decisions for themselves. So we need to be careful about that. But sometimes love and concern for someone will cause us to say no when they've asked for something. If your child were asking you to let them play in the middle of a busy intersection, you wouldn't allow them to do that for obvious reasons. We have to use good judgment in determining whether or not to help someone and, and whether or not there really is a need that can be ministered to. And if someone asks to borrow something, we need to be generous. We need to realize that what we have is not ours, it's God's. We're stewards of it. My name might be on the title to my truck, but I don't own it. It's God's truck. Don't come up asking me to borrow my truck after the service. But. <laughs> uh. <clears throat> but I would encourage each of us to be good stewards of everything that God has entrusted to us. Realize that it is a blessing. Realize that it is His to distribute as He chooses. And as the, we are reminded so often, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. We can trust those things to Him. Don't lend something to someone if you think it will bring them harm, but if you can help someone, then be willing to help them out. I've seen parents, unfortunately, have to live with this dilemma with adult children. Children who are grown and should know better doing things that they shouldn't be involved in and ending up in situations where the parent is faced with a very difficult dilemma of do I help them? And if I help them, am I hurting them more than I'm really helping them? That's a horrible place to be. That's a difficult decision. Sometimes as a parent, the best thing to do is let them experience the consequences of the choices that they've made even though that's very difficult. There's a real difference between a person who's trying to do things right and a person who is clearly re repetitiously making decisions to put themselves in a bad place. Sometimes the best way we can love them is to allow them to suffer the consequences. But many times in life we're faced with people who genuinely need help. We may not always have money to offer them, but we might have time, we might have food, we might have clothing that we can offer to help. We need to be willing to use whatever resources that God has given us to be a help to them. God will bless what we have when we use it for His glory. You remember the account of Elijah going to the widow and her son who didn't have much of anything. 
And Elijah said, fix this for me. Now, I mean, let's be honest. Most of us might look at that and go, <laughs> dude, I got enough to make it another day or two. That's it. I'm, I'm sorry. I'd love to be able to help, but I just don't have it. But she followed the prophet's instructions. And you remember what God did. God blessed what she had, and she continued to have more than she needed, far beyond she ever expected God to provide. When we're faithful to trust what we have to God, God takes care of our needs. God provides for us. Above and beyond what we could expect, we must simply be good stewards. We must simply be obedient with what God uh, has entrusted to us. God will not allow His children to go without their needs being met. Let's be honest. Too many times we confuse wants with needs. But God will take care of our needs. God will provide for our needs. As Christian people, we need to be a people of high character. We need to be people who will show restraint, who will resist doing things in response to people who have wronged us, who will show humility, who are willing to serve others and to put others' needs ahead of our own. We need to be willing to submit to God first. When we submit to God first, then we can submit to others and put uh, again put others ahead of ourselves. And then finally, when we do that, we can be generous with what God has entrusted to us. Not out of obligation to God, but out of love for Him. If you're sitting here today and you realize that you've not been the person of character that God would have you to be, the good news is God's not done with you. The good news is we serve a God who is a God of not just second chances, but many, 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 many times infinity chances as long as we're here on this earth. We have a chance every day to serve God. Be willing to admit your sin and ask God to help you. Be faithful to be that person of character that He's called you to be. Perhaps you realize this morning that you've not been generous with what God has entrusted to you. Ask God to help you have a generous heart. Ask God to help you see those opportunities around you. Again, with caution, don't enable someone. Paul makes it very clear in Thessalonians, if a man won't work, he shouldn't eat. We're not to enable people, but we are instructed in the Word of God to help people and not to draw attention to ourselves when we do. You know, it's, it's not about, hey, I want you to know what I did for so-and-so. No, it's about being obedient to God and doing what you do to, glor to glorify God. God often places people in our path so that we'll have an opportunity to be blessed by Him as we're a blessing to them. You may be here this morning, and none of this makes sense to you. Why in the world would I do any of that? Let me tell you why we as Christians do that, because as Christians we realize that God gave us everything, and without Him we'd have nothing. Now, I'm not talking about the stuff of this world. I'm talking about forgiveness of sin and eternal life. If you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Christ, you don't realize it, but you're a slave to sin right now. And you can, you can dig your heels in, you can buck up at me and say, oh, I'm no slave. I do what I want to do. Do you, though? Do you really? You're a slave to the passions of your heart because God is not in your life. But that can change today. You can understand, you, you can begin to understand today that the most generous gift you've ever been given the opportunity to receive is when God sent His Son to die on a cross for your sin. Admit to yourself and agree with God that you're a sinner. Be honest. There's not a single time anybody had to sit you down and tell you how to do wrong. You knew how to do that. You know how to do that. But you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ today by admitting you're a sinner and asking Him into your life. He wants to forgive you. He wants you to have a relationship with Him. He wants you to know the joy of forgiveness and eternity with Him. Take care of that issue today. Don't leave here the same way you came. Know that your eternity is, is in His hands. But here's the scary thing. If you don't settle that issue, you will spend your eternity in a lake of fire. That's not my opinion. I tell you that on the authority of the Word of God. The Word of God makes that very clear. Don't let that be your eternity. Trust in Him today. Whatever your need is right now, whatever your burden is right now, Christian, brothers and sisters, there may be people in your life that you're praying for 
to come to faith in Christ. Use this time right now to pray for them, to lift them up. Pray that God would soften their hearts and prepare them to hear the good news. And be willing to be the one to share. And if you're not the one to share, pray that God would put people in their path that will tell them about Christ. But pray for them to come to faith. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for this challenge from your word, God. Help us to be people of character. Help us to be people who live out your truth in our lives. God, forgive us where we failed you. Lord, we, we, we thank you that you use broken and flawed vessels like us. Lord, there's not a single one of us here who are perfect. Every one of us as Christians know that we fail you regularly. But God, I thank you that you choose to use us in spite of our frailties, in spite of our sin. So God, we pray we'd be useful in your hands. And Lord, I pray for the one here today that doesn't know you. It's never genuinely place their trust in you. I pray right now they'd ask your forgiveness and trust in you. And then God, in just a moment when the invitation begins, I pray you'd give them the courage to step out of that pew and come and share with me the decision they've made to follow you as Savior and Lord. God, whatever the needs are right now, we trust each of those to you. It's in your powerful and precious name we pray these things. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our hymn of invitation.